our cars on and how long it'll take to get the new technology off the drawing board and into the car showrooms. It's the oil capital of Europe, but already Aberdeen is having to face up to an industry in decline. Slowly, the firms that prospect and drill for oil are slipping away from the North Sea. Demand for oil is soaring, and with it the price. But discoveries are getting thinner, and the cost of production is rising, especially in the older fields. Some believe we're at the beginning of the end of the oil epoch. It's not a question of the oil running out. We're, we're never going to see oil running out. There will always be the dregs of oil fields stuck in the ground because it's dispersed through the rocks and through the sand and the rest of it. It just becomes much more expensive to extract. Um, and, it, um, and if demand exceeds supply at the same time as the costs of extraction rise, then we see a, a very serious price crunch indeed. In the year 2000, total demand for oil was 3,604 million tonnes. In the richest countries, transport accounts for the biggest share, with industry and power generation dominant among the other uses. In the developing world, there are fewer cars, so oil for transport is less important. But by 2030, the picture will have changed. World demand will be 5,769 million tonnes, and while the rich countries will be using an even bigger proportion for transport, the poorer countries' oil profile will look like ours does now. And it's all because of humanity's love affair with the motor car. Luckily, there's a solution. And while it's not exactly ready for the production line, it's gone beyond the realms of science fiction. This car runs off hydrogen, and there's a growing conviction that what's in here could provide a total solution to the oil problem. The technology works like this. This hydrogen fuel cell converts the chemical energy stored here into electrical energy, which drives the car. Now pay attention because you could be tinkering around with a power unit like this in your car within 10 years. Of course, 10 years ago, all this was just lab technology. But today, I can take a test drive on the open road. It drives like a cross between a Dodgem and a Robin Reliant. But this is just a cheap Indian model converted to prove the concept. The company that built the hydrogen engine is deadly serious about this technology. It's run by former North Sea oil men who've seen the writing on the wall. Looking at the uh, field data that I'd been analysing for a number of years, it was very clear that we're facing a very serious problem in hydrocarbon uh, production. Uh, there might be oil in the ground, but we're not going to be able to produce it fast enough to meet the ever-growing demand. And something at some point has to give. And we saw the hydrogen fuel cell technologies as an opportunity to begin to displace fossil hydrocarbons, albeit very slowly, but progressively that will accelerate. Until the late 1990s, the big car companies dismissed the idea of fuel cell engines, but they don't anymore. Ford and, and other manufacturers would agree that the, the future is hydrogen. I don't think it's so much what the fuel is in the future, it's a question of the pace of change, which is really uh, the big debate at the moment. We have to address the infrastructure issues. There has to be access to these fuels for our customers. They have to be able to purchase this fuel, they have to be able to refuel their vehicle. And we also have to address the very fundamental concern of accessing this hydrogen from renewable sources, be it solar or wind. You won't find hydrogen power in ordinary Ford production vehicles yet. But like most big car makers, they do have test cars on the road. So when could we go into a car dealer and buy one? The next phase of the Ford program in the 2007 time frame will be putting greater quantities of vehicles out into the marketplace to prove out the technology, to prove that there are no durability issues and that there is customer acceptance for this technology. And if you're looking at when can you actually go out and buy a fuel cell, I think you're really looking at the, the 2010, 2012 time frame. There are two big advantages to hydrogen and one big disadvantage. 
The plus points are, A, it's everywhere. It forms 75% of the universe. And B, hydrogen fuel gives off zero pollution. The problem with hydrogen is, it's not really an energy source at all. In nature, hydrogen likes to stick to other things, as in H2O. And you need another source of power to separate it. So even if we do opt for hydrogen-fueled cars, we're still back with the old debate between fossil fuels, nuclear and renewable sources like wind and waves. And guess what? The hydrogen lobby can't agree on which is best. Tonight I'm proposing $1.2 billion in research funding so that America can lead the world in developing clean, hydrogen-powered automobiles. The Bush plan sees 90% of the hydrogen coming from fossil fuels, with the other 10% from nuclear. Sustainable energy is dismissed as too expensive. The men who put together our little green car think otherwise. If we were to exploit the renewable energy resources we have around the UK, and the UK has the highest level of renewable energy concentration in the whole of Europe, we could dramatically decrease our dependence on the import of fossil hydrocarbons uh, and have a big impact on the environment and have a big impact on our balance of payments. The biggest problem facing the transition is the existing infrastructure. The pipelines and petrol stations worth an estimated six trillion dollars worldwide. Writing that off would require an economic revolution much bigger than the one Henry Ford started. Energy transitions take a long time. It's clear to see from the longevity of the Route Master bus, for example, on London streets, that once something is put in place that works well, it's difficult to change it. And so the hydrogen transition is more a 50-year, 60-year, 70-year solution to the end state. That doesn't mean that somewhere along the road, from five years to ten years from now, we won't have a significant amount of our energy that can be used from hydrogen. And hydrogen supporters do not use the word end state lightly. This, they say, will be humanity's last energy transition. And the big energy systems that shaped the last 100 years will be transformed. What is likely to happen is a much more decentralized system of energy production and distribution. And that's very, very interesting for the way that we react to energy. At the moment, it's produced centrally. It's, uh, it's transported from very long distances over very large infrastructures. We are likely to become much more personally involved in energy. We are likely to, to have things that are even attached to our vehicles, attached to our houses, that enable us to have some sort of cushioning from these large centralized schemes. To start the transition to a hydrogen economy, it's not enough to put public funds into researching the technology. There has to be a clear policy signal given to consumers and companies alike. If the economy is likely to go into recession, if the oil price keeps rising, then the time to invest in all this is now. But the political pressure for the investment in the re-engineering of our cities, the re-engineering of our infrastructure, the reduction of our use of oil, that pressure's not 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 there at the moment. People don't riot for austerity. They riot because they want more of something, not because they want less of something. We've got to start rioting for less. They may write one day that the hydrogen age began somewhere between the first working hydrogen car and the day oil reached $50 a barrel. Few doubt that day is close at hand. The technology's not perfect, but it's getting there. The energy companies are already spending millions on this stuff, and they're thinking 50 years ahead. But if the next step is to be taken, it will have to be taken by governments. When it happens, our roads will echo to the sound of silence, and life for boy racers will never be the same again. Uh, 